In the summer of 2012, the various bands that I was in throughout high school, none of which were any good at all, by the way, uh, we started getting ourselves out there a little bit and playing some shows, and eventually I met a local promoter who put us on a festival that he was doing called Rockapalooza. Uh, of course, I should mention we didn't get on the festival the organic way. Uh, I made the very amateur mistake of buying on. The festival was headlined by such acts at the time as MGK, uh, who at that time wasn't much more than a club or theater headliner, uh, The Devil Wears Prada, Attack Attack, etc., uh, anyways, the promoter ended up rounding up some of the people that he knew, myself included, to pass out flyers to promote Rockapalooza at another festival taking place that summer, Mayhem Fest. I've mentioned the 2012 Mayhem Fest on the channel before, uh, but that year Slipknot was headlining along with Slayer, Motorhead, Anthrax, and a ton of other bands. It was really a great show. And at that time, I honestly wasn't really a fan of Slipknot, uh, and I didn't really care one way or the other about seeing them. But right after Motorhead played, uh, right before Slayer set, the Rockapalooza promoter came up to me and handed me a pair of pit passes as a sort of payment for passing out flyers all day. Fast forward to Slipknot set, and my God, what a show. From the production to the set list, everything was just absolutely incredible. Uh, of course, at this time, though, uh, bassist Paul Gray had already passed away about two years prior uh, with Slipknot founded guitar player Donnie Steele performing in his place. Since then, there have been a handful of lineup changes in the band with Alessandro Venturella, uh, a.k.a. V-Man, now on bass, Jay Weinberg replacing Joey Jordison on drums after Joey's exit in 2013, and most recently, longtime percussionist Chris Fain's replacement, Michael Pfaff, better known as Tortilla Man. So today, we're gonna take a look at who V-Man, Tortilla Man, and Jay Weinberg wore before they became part of the Nine. Back in 2007, Sid Wilson introduced Sean Cran, AKA Clown, of course, to fellow musician Michael Pfaff, who also holds a master's and undergraduate degree in music. The two hit it off right off the rip, and at their first ever jam session together, Clown could only focus on his musical chemistry with Michael, saying, quote, it was the way he was throwing his shapes to my shapes. This ultimately led to the formation of the band Dirty Little Rabbits, along with bassist Jeff Karnowski, vocalist Stella Katsudas, and guitarist Ty Fury. A quick sidebar on Ty Fury, I used to be a concert promoter, just doing mostly club level type of stuff, and at one point I had booked everybody's favorite 2000s rock band, Trapped. <laughs> At that time, Ty was the guitar player, but he has uh, since moved on, probably for the best for him. And the last I heard, he was the guitar tech for uh, Jason Aldean, I think it was. It's probably a good thing that he got out of there. Anyways, Dirty Little Rabbits went on to release two EPs, Breeding in 07, which was only available through select music stores, uh, and it's pretty difficult to find. I even checked eBay and Discogs uh, to no avail. They released a follow-up in 2009, the widely available Simon EP, and a self-titled Full Length in 2010, which they supported on Warp Tour of that year before playing their final show in October of 2010. In March of 2019, Chris Fain filed a lawsuit against Slipknot over withheld payments, specifically pointing out Corey Taylor and Sean Cran, but we're not going to get into all of that here. Uh, we could probably take a deep dive and do a whole nother video on that at some point, as there's so much to get into with that. But that, of course, led to Chris's departure from Slipknot, with Clown reaching out to Michael right away uh, at his day job to see if he was interested in filling the spot. It wasn't until just last year, though, in 2022, that his identity was confirmed when Slipknot released a photo of him holding a sign that said, I am Michael Pfaff, and announcing a Reddit AMA. Prior to the announcement, though, there was plenty of speculation that it was Pfaff all along, as he was spotted at an airport at one point with other members of Slipknot, and most notably in 2020, when Slipknot released Neck Gators and their UK store made an error, labeling his as the Pfaff Neck Gator face cover, uh, but it was quickly fixed, uh, and also at that time, he would just sign merch as new guy. 
Obviously, he was known as Tortilla Man prior to the formal announcement due to his mask resembling a tortilla, but Faf has said that the mask is actually a mold of his face inside out. He has indeed accepted the nickname of Tortilla Man, though, setting his Instagram handle as Tortilla Faf. One funny thing to note before we move on, uh, last month the band was playing in Guadalajara where security mistook him during Slipknot set, mind you, for a fan. He had jumped off the stage and security was holding him back from getting on before finally being told by what appears to be Slipknot's crew that he was part of the band. And uh, here's the video to check out. And he commented on the video himself uh, saying that he wasn't mad and security was just doing their job. And he also said, quote, I was just trying to get to the maggots that couldn't see me. Following Paul Gray's tragic death from an overdose in 2010, it would take the band four years to find a permanent replacement, Alessandro Venturella. Better known as V-Man, he was already a seasoned pro prior to joining The Knot, as in the same year that Slipknot released their Smash debut in 1999, he was in his native England forming the metal band Cry for Silence. Much like Dirty Little Rabbits, Cry for Silence released two EPs and one full length, 2001's Through the Precious Words, The Longest Day in 2004, and their full length, The Glory is Dead in 2008. They also toured with such acts as The Black Dahlia Murder, From Autumn to Ashes, Sepultura, and Strung Out. They have also been cited as a big influence for a number of other bands, most notably Enter Shikari. Upon their disbanding shortly after releasing The Glory is Dead, Alessandro went on to play guitar in the band Crocodile, as well as work as a guitar tech, uh, touring with Fightstar, Coheed and Cambria. Uh, I also read somewhere that he worked for Lost Profits at a time, yikes, as well as his last gig before joining Slipknot teching for Mastodon's Brent Hines. While he was on tour with Mastodon, Jim Root reached out to him with V-Man saying, quote, me and Jim became friends while I was teching. He was asking if I knew any bass players. When I found out what for, I put my hand up right away. He pointed out, but you don't play bass. And I said something to the effect that I could do whatever he needed from me. Then I just had to make sure it was true. Alessandro made his first appearance with the band at the 2014 edition of Not Best, as well as played on the band's fifth album, Point Five, The Grey Chapter, uh, which was released in the same year. It is also important to note that Donnie Steele also contributed bass to the album, but it's unclear on which songs he appears on. And you know, I do find it interesting, as a buddy of mine pointed out, that for the most part, he doesn't really uh, get compared to Paul all that often, if ever. Uh, and when asked in an interview about replacing Paul, he said, quote, My approach isn't the same as Paul's. I can't be him and never will be. Every player is ultimately born different. That said, if you listen to Paul's note choices on Vermilion, he was all over the shop and it sounded great. I wanted to try things like that. After listening to his stems, I honestly looked at bass in a different light and understood how to support everything as the backbone. Take the bass out of the mix and everything will fall flat on its ass. And equally, if you mix too bass heavy, you're not going to get your point across either. Lead guitarists, on the other hand, always need to cut through because that's what the job entails. As the rhythm section, we're there to hold the fort. Much like his current bandmate, Michael Pfaff, it would take quite a while for the band to formally announce him, finally happening in May of 2015 in an interview that Jim Root did. That said, again like Tortilla Man, it had already basically been confirmed by that point that it was indeed Alessandro Venturella playing bass, mostly due to his obvious and very unique tattoos, and more specifically, his hand tattoos when he appeared in the video for The Devil and I. When asked in a recent interview if he got into any sort of trouble uh, for his identity being revealed from the video before an official announcement was made, he said, quote, Oh no, there was no trouble. It was a funny one because I remember saying, should I put some black tattoo gloves on or something like that? And they were like, ah, no one's going to get it. And I was like, okay, I've worked for quite a few high-profile bands. If it's not going to be called out by a fan, it's going to be called out by someone in a teching position or someone from another band going, oh, that's fucking V-Man. That's V-Man's tattoo. I mean, once you've seen my tattoos, it's pretty obvious who it is. And then there was also a good grace period of six months where I just disappeared off the face of the planet. And I was getting messages. I couldn't tell anyone what I was doing. 
I was like, I'm just away at the moment. I think it kind of got pieced together pretty quickly. This, of course, wouldn't be a Slipknot discussion without knowing what Corey Taylor thinks. And when asked in an interview around the release of Point Five, The Grey Chapter about the tattoo incident, he had this to say. It wasn't something we had even thought of, and it didn't even occur to us until it hit. I was like, oh, man, come on. But the funny thing is, I was doing a radio interview, and I was laughing about it. And then the story got picked up by all these media outlets that implied I was incensed, angry, and outraged. No, not really. If you listen to the interview, I'm laughing my ass off. It just goes to show you, in this TMZ world, people are going to pick up something just so they can make a story out of it. It would be nothing for me to make an argument of it, but at that point it was like, man, who gives a shit? Any suspicions were later confirmed in December of 2014 when a drum tech by the name of Norm Costa was fired from Slipknot and then posted a photo of a document on his Instagram essentially confirming both Alessandro's identity as well as that of the top secret new drummer, Jay Weinberg. Hands down the most reputable replacement member in Slipknot, Jay Weinberg is of course the son of legendary Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band drummer, Max Weinberg. After becoming a self-taught drummer at the age of 14, Jay's first bands were a metal band called Chaosis and a punk band called The Reveling. Around the time he joined The Reveling in summer 2008, he also sat in for his dad during the song Born to Run in front of a sold-out giant stadium to a huge response from the crowd. Shortly after that show, The Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien, who by the way was without a doubt the best modern era late night host, uh, that show was premiering and of course Max was Conan's band leader so there was a bit of a scheduling conflict. The obvious choice and the best choice to keep fan satisfaction as according to Bruce's manager John Landau was of course Jay. One day when driving with Jay, Bruce called Max with Max saying quote, he wanted to talk to Jay. He said to him, Jay, this is Bruce. You may have heard I have a band. In that band, I have the world's greatest drummer who has a scheduling conflict. He gave me your name and number and suggested that I call you to see if you'd be interested in playing with me and the E Street Band. Jay filled in for his dad with Bruce all throughout 2009, playing all around the world, including festivals such as Pink Pop in the Netherlands and Bonnaroo outside of Nashville. When he wasn't playing stadiums with Bruce, he was playing sweaty nightclubs with the Reveling and had this to say about the wild dynamics of both gigs. I liked the duality of it all. I like doing this just as much as I like doing that. No pun was intended there, I'm sure. In February of 2010, Jay joined the legendary New York hardcore band Madball, appearing on their Empire album released in the same year. However, by September, Vocalist Freddie Madball released a statement saying, quote, I'm letting Jay go mid-tour in Canada because I just feel he doesn't represent this band well on a character level. Jay issued a response to this, noting that he had already quit the band by that time and adding, quote, while I really enjoyed playing the music, I do not subscribe to their choice of habits and lifestyle. This past August, while on tour in Europe, disturbing events within the band indicated to me that it was time for me to move on. Almost immediately upon his exit from Madball, Jay announced that he would be drumming for the band Against Me, filling in for their drummer George Rebello, who had to tour with his other band, Hot Water Music. He began recording their sixth studio album with them, but ultimately left the band in December of 2012 before the record was finished uh, without letting any of the band members know and simply putting out a post on social media that read, I want to let you all know that I am leaving against me and I wish them all the best. The other members responded by tweeting nothing but a picture of a drum machine. During his time in Against Me, Jay also filled in for a short run of dates with the indie rock band Fences, covering for their drummer, Elliot Garm Chaffee. Upon Joey Jordison's highly controversial departure from Slipknot, at the tail end of 2013, Jay ended up taking the throne, again, no pun intended, first appearing, of course, on 2014's Point Five, The Grey Chapter along with Alessandro Venturella. The story of his audition, though, is absolutely insane, as he didn't know who he was auditioning for until just 20 minutes prior. In an interview, he said, quote, After spending a lot of time on the road with different bands, I stopped touring entirely and went back to school. 
my manager who managed this band I used to be in calls me and says, what are you doing? I have something and I think you'd want to do it. Can you just trust me and get out here to LA without hesitation? I was just like, yeah, okay, I can do that. I didn't know what it was for, but I knew if someone was asking me to come and play drums on something, I want to kick the shit out of it. I go out there and go to the studio and they're like, all right, there's a drum set. We'll bring in Slipknot in like 20 minutes. That cool? I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Just from going on muscle memory from when I was like 14 or 15 in my shed, we played about 20 Slipknot songs. And it was like, all right, man, if you want this, then it's yours. In a separate interview, he elaborates on the audition saying, quote, Clown asked me, do you know any Slipknot songs? And I was like, yeah, how about we start with these? And we started with Before I Forget and Duality. Those were the first songs we ever played together. And when we played those, the whole vibe of the room started to change. And they were like, well, that sounded fucking awesome. Do you know anything else? And I was like, yeah, let's play Disaster Piece. And then we were just calling out, let's do B-sides from the first record. Let's play Get This. And at that time, it was clear that this was heading for a holy shit. This is lightning in a bottle. We're really onto something kind of moment. And it just built and built. And my audition with Slipknot, a lot of those songs I hadn't played along to since I was 14, just figuring out how to play drums. So a lot of my playing that day was based on muscle memory from when I was 14. It was a really wild experience to draw from, oh, maybe this is what happens in this part. And my muscle memory came rushing back. There's certainly a lot of pressure that would come along with replacing an absolute monster such as Joey Jordison, but Jay stressed that he did not want to be a carbon copy of Joey, saying, quote, Joey's one of the greatest drummers we've ever had the privilege of witnessing. So as a fan of the band and someone who respects the people and the music, I didn't want to come in and try to be a copycat. That's not interesting to me. That's not interesting to the band, and it would be insulting to everyone involved, including the fans. This, of course, is very widely known, but the ironic thing about Jay joining Slipknot is that they were indeed his favorite band of all time, and there's a very famous photo of him as a young kid, maybe like nine years old or something, and he's backstage with Jim Root when his dad, Max, took him to Ozfest to see the band, and he was actually able to recreate this photo a few years back, and I gotta admit, it's uh, it kind of chokes me up a little bit. I, I can't even imagine being a hardcore fan of a band, and then ending up in that band a little later on down the road. I mean, that's just crazy. Talk about a dream come true. But you can hear a similar story by checking out my recent interview with former Judas Priest vocalist, Tim Ripper Owens. All right, though, I got to run. My fiance is waiting for me to slip her into a knot, so I got to go. But thanks so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you want to see more, and I will see you next time.